This is a Momentum Media production. The SMSF Advisor Show. Your expert insights into the biggest things shaping the SMSF advice industry. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the SMSF Advisor Show. I'm Miranda Brownlee, and I'm joined by my co-host, Aaron Dunn. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Miranda. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Just floating above water. 30 June always comes with its challenges, and I'm sure many of our listeners out there are um, either working through the kind of year-end tax planning bit or trying to finish off work. Yeah, it's always a um, busy time, I find. Yes, I'm sure there's a lot of busy people out there right now. <laughs> yeah, it's this kind of last uh, last hit, but we don't have weekends or anything to deal with, so we'll kind of get to Thursday and then we'll wake up and the sun will rise again on Friday and it'll be a new financial year. Yes, so speaking of new financial year, we've got some important changes coming up with the work test changes and also uh, the change in the age limit for the downsize contributions as well. Yeah, so these, you know, we've spoken about these over the past few months since the government obviously finalised these. And it is a timely reminder, you know, that there are some great opportunities for clients and their advisors to work through with their clients um, on many of these things. There are a few things to naturally remember as well. So, you know, there may be subject to, you know, deeds and so forth and documents that you use. You may need to obviously give some consideration to that stuff, but by and large, we've got some um, yeah, pretty exciting strategies and stuff ahead. That's uh, something you'll be speaking about in detail in some of your upcoming uh, SMSF days. Yeah, so we have our SMSF days back face-to-face. So I think that's the most exciting thing. So our SMSF day events we're holding around Australia from the 14th of July through to the 3rd of August. And yeah, that topic of contributions and I guess the opportunities was something that when we were putting the program together, the feedback was very clear that that was a topic that they wanted to talk about. So we'll be really drilling down into you know what these changes mean and what you need to be across as you work through these with your clients from 1 July 2022. The other thing that we've sort of seen in the news this week is around the quality of advice review with a lot of the submissions coming out for the issues paper. I've obviously seen a lot around the whole piece in terms of whether accountants should be able to provide some sort of strategic advice with superannuation and a few things along those lines. Yeah, so obviously we're seeing a very uniform approach to the responses being provided to the quality of advice review where we are seeing a number of professional bodies come together in particular around that consumer-centric approach to advice and trying to simplify a system that's, yeah, kind of just overbearing, I guess, in all fronts, both for the advisors, but ultimately for the clients. And you know, one of these real issues that we've seen is the, um, you know, the limited licensing framework that has been introduced clearly isn't working. The reality is, is you know, we're under a 1,000 professionals left in that net and continues to reduce. And therefore, it's about trying to work through in this process a you know, a revised model that would work for the right type of accountants that would move into this framework as well. I don't think this is generally saying, you know, let's let anyone that that holds a um, shingle to being an accountant can come in. There's going to have to be some other competencies and stuff that go around that, that, that acknowledge their skills and stuff in the self-managed super fund industry. And, and this is something that you know goes off the back of the recommendations from the tax practitioners board review. And certainly there is a held view around how this can work on the basis that we've seen financial advisors move out of TASA, so the Tax Aid Administration Services, and move back into ASIC's jurisdiction. So there is a way in which that could potentially work that would incorporate the um, you know, the suitably qualified accountants to potentially come back in and, and have a role in the simplified and strategic type advice rather than product advice. Yes, the submissions have definitely sort of stressed that it wouldn't be a return to the accountant's exemption, that they would have to have some kind of sort of specialised accreditation to go with that so that they are, they do have the knowledge to sort of give that advice. Yeah, and again, it goes back to, so where do you regulate that from? So, you know, there's a framework under the Tax Agent Services Act, but 
as you rightly said then, uh, it, it can't be just for anyone. There's got to be a, a framework around it. We saw a framework, you know, get introduced with the auditor registration approach as well. So now whether that means you're a specialist or whether that means you need to have a minimum level of competency and a minimum number of funds and stuff you run, you know, this is part of what the review will look to flesh out over 2022. And there were also some suggestions around what could be done to sort of improve data access for advisors, as that is a bit of a pain point for a lot of advice firms as well at the moment. Yeah, so we've got there not only advisors, but even administrators. So where you're not looking after the individual's information, it can become quite problematic in not only trying to plan and do that advice, but obviously administer issues as well. So yes, so that that access to information was certainly put very high in some of the um, responses that we saw from industry back into this review. The other thing that we saw come out was a court case. So Squirrel Super was ordered to pay $55,000 penalty for a misleading brochure distributed, which was to do with SMSF's investing in property. Yeah, so again, you know, ASICs has, I guess, their foot firmly on the throat of those that don't comply with what are the current AFSL requirements around this. And um, you know, I guess this is yet another example. We probably several times uh, over the journey with our SMS of Advisors show, we, we see these appear and appear regularly, but the result ultimately all lands the same, doesn't it? Yes, it is probably worth pointing out too that they had had a huge, obviously the whole management has been replaced, so it wasn't actually the management now that put out, distributed the brochure, but yes, obviously ASIC still did pursue those penalties, so they are taking it quite seriously. So, yeah, yeah, and it's just a, it's a lesson, isn't it, that again, that you know, ASIC is playing a very active role within the SMS space around consumer protections and, and so forth, so making sure you know, you're operating within the within the framework that exists, and if you kind of stick your neck out a bit further than you should, it'll potentially get whacked. We also saw the ATO put out a bit of data about where lodgements are at, so that just over eighty percent as of sort of mid last week, and uh, there's currently around 138 lapsed lodges at the moment, and they've just sort of flagged a few concerns about there being possible early release and concerns such as that? Yeah, so you know, quite clearly we're coming off the back of you know what has been a pretty tough couple of years. And the ATO, as they're in their role as regulator, obviously going through and trying to ensure that you know, the level of, of lodgements uh, lifts. And you know, talking to practitioners, we know that there are still a lot of challenges, not only in trying to get those returns done, but you have to remember as well, this year for the first time, We've probably had, you know, quarter third, and we'll probably get this data from the ATO uh, in the not too distant future. But a, you know, a third of the industry has gone through probably a new appointment of an auditor. So the impact of something like that will mean that the information and the process in which that audit needs to be completed is going to be quite different to what it has in the past. So I'd be fascinated to see through this process and the some 138,000 that are outstanding, you know, the ATO have raised some concerns about, well, are there some illegal early access stuff, you know, COVID, we understand the impacts and so forth, but how much of it may actually just relate to the additional timeframes that have been, that auditors and the expectation and the uplift of what auditors want to get may be impacting that as well. And, and I know having spoken to a few people, as I would obviously do in the industry, those sort of challenges, I think, are absolutely take, uh, having a role at this point in time. So I don't think there may be as many that may be in that problem. I could be wrong in terms of the, the early release stuff. I'll be fascinated to see the data on how many have changed and then therefore what the uh, time frame impact has been with that change of auditor this year. Yes, I can imagine navigating through the new processes with a new auditor would add a lot of time and that's yep. possibly contributed to some of those delays, I would imagine. Yeah, so permanent records is certainly one thing that auditors would want to see for a first time, You know, things like declarations and deeds, and then you've got the additional requirements through market valuations and you know the evidence that supports with comparable sales for, for real estate and so forth. So there's 
there's a range of stuff that I think is playing a role, and and this will be a transition year. You know, the true measure of that change, I think, will come in 12 months and 24 months' time once the dust has settled through that. But I think there's a few reasons, I guess, ultimately is what I'm saying as to why we might be just that little bit further behind than what the ATL would like. So the other big thing that's happened in the last fortnight is we've had the Hill versus Zuda decision handed down by the High Court. And um, shortly we're going to be joined by Bryce Figo, special counsel from DBA Lawyers, who's going to take us through what this decision means for SBSFs and any kind of updates or things that might need to be considered with uh, documents and trustees. We're now joined by Bryce Figo from DBA Lawyers. Hi, Bryce. Hi, Miranda. Hi, Aaron. Thank you very much for having me today. Thanks for joining us. So we've obviously had this quite important case, uh, Hill versus Zuda, yes. handed down from the High Court. Yes. Uh, can you give us a quick overview about what this case was about and what it means for SMSFs? Yeah. So to answer the second part first, what does this mean for SMSFs? Uh, it is now official that it is possible for a binding death benefit nomination for a self-managed super fund to last not three years, but indeed indefinitely. Uh, so non-lapsing. In a nutshell, that's the real headline implication for self-managed super funds. Now, to answer the first part, second, uh, what was this case about? Basically, you had a, um, a self-managed super fund, uh, the Holly Superannuation Fund, and there was somewhat unusually, but you know, fine, written into the deed, something describing itself as a binding death benefit nomination. And it said that upon the death of the fund members, and the fund members were Mr. Soddy uh, and his de facto spouse, uh, Ms. Murray, uh, upon the death of either Mr. Soddy or Ms. Murray, if, if Mr. Soddy died, then the benefits pursuant to this thing that called itself a uh, binding death benefit nomination, uh, his benefits would have to go to Ms. Murray and vice versa. Anyway, uh, that was made in 2011, and in 2016, i.e. more than three years later, Mr. Soddy indeed did die, and there appears to have been a dispute with Mr. Soddy's daughter from a, a separate relationship, uh, Ms. Hill, and Ms. Murray, who by this stage was running the fund, the, the trustee of which is a company called Zuda Proprietary Limited, hence the name Hill and Zuda. Zuda Proprietary Limited, controlled at this stage by uh, Ms. Murray, said, well, look, there's a binding death benefit nomination. We're just going to pay, you know, we're not going to give you any money. We're not going to give you any information, let alone any money. Um, we're obligated to pay the money straight to uh, Ms. Murray. And uh, you know, Ms. Hill said, well, no, I think that the thing purporting to be a binding death benefit nomination is invalid. It was made more than three years ago. And I think that Regulation 6.17a of the CIS regulations actually applies to self-managed super funds. And Regulation 6.17a says a number of things including that a binding death benefit nomination can last for no more than three years. And she was unsuccessful uh, at two matters in the WA Supreme Court. She took it to the Court of Appeal and was unsuccessful, and she took it to the High Court, where she was also unsuccessful. But uh, importantly for us, uh, you know, as the castle tells us, you know, it's the biggest court in the land. And you know, once you go to the, the High Court, and it was a, a seven-zip ruling as well, so unanimous, uh, you don't get a stronger High Court ruling than that. So it's now very, you know, to the extent that we can ever truly have certainty in the law, we now have certainty that if the deed is appropriately written, regulation 6.17a does not apply to self-managed super funds. And that is where the three-year rule lives. So long story short, the three-year rule does not apply to self-managed super funds. So Bryce, whilst we're on the topic of the castle and, and the vibe, because <laughs> the vibe was very clear here, yes. seven nil. This yep. is a vibe that has been also quite clear in various jurisdictions around Australia as well. So, and I think yes. they referenced those. Uh, I think Cantor was definitely referenced in there, and I think Naruman and some of those. So, yep, this was this was not a case that I guess the court was saying was grossly wrong in terms of the way that it had been interpreted and the views that the ATO had expressed as well. So, the importance here, I think, as you rightly said, is is we now have a decision in the highest court of Australia, Yes, but the vibe hasn't changed. Yes. So, uh, yeah, which is lovely to have that certainty, uh, quite frankly. And look, I mean, if for whatever the reason the High Court had decided this case the other way, I mean, just practically, it would have been very difficult. A lot of people would have had invalid 
you know, p- people who had made binding death benefit things that they thought were binding death benefit nominations more than three years ago would have had to have remade them, which could be a big problem if they've, you know, lost capacity Impressive. or et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yep. Yeah. So I think, you know, Miranda touched on initially what does it mean, but one of the interesting things quite clearly in an area that you do a lot of work in is obviously the, the construct of mm. SMS FDs and, and BDBNs in practice. And I'm, yes. I guess one thing we regularly also see is, is that some deeds the way in which it might be prescribed in that deed is is that you would follow, in essence, what the regulations are saying. Mm. So can you give us a bit of a summary as to you know, what this decision means in the context of deeds and what advisors should be looking out for? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So look, one of the wonderful aspects of this case is because we can now say through a confidence that regulation 6.178 does not apply to self-managed super funds. Therefore, it's really what the deed says. Mm. Uh so it's now up to people to think, well, gee, what do, what do I want my deed to say now? Mm. Well, obviously, you don't have complete carte blanche when it comes to drafting the deed. You can't say the money goes to a charity or grandchildren. Uh, you know, Obviously, you're still limited by the other things in CIS, such as upon my death, it's only to my dependents, my LPR generally. But with that caveat, you know, now that we've acknowledged that caveat, yeah, it's really up to the deed. So uh, if the deed wants to say things like, you know, the binding death benefit nomination can A, last indefinitely, and Reg 6.17a does not apply, it can. Plus, there's a whole bunch of other quite, uh, dare I say, clever and important things which you'd want the deed to say, which now it can. And uh, I'll just make a shameless plug, <laughs> which the DBA lawyers deed does say. And indeed, if he, you know, and it's not just the current deed, but we've been putting this in the deed for many years prior. So we, we felt very validated and, and chuffed by uh, the way Hill and Zuda was decided. So number one, I'll, I'll just say it because this is always very controversial. What wins a BDBN versus pension documentation? And yeah, I think these days most people are coming around to uh, what I would consider the truth, that is the binding death benefit nomination overrides the pension. There used to be a view a number of years ago that people thought pensions would override BDBNs, but I think that's falling by the wayside. Uh, Now, that being said, though, if the deed expressly says the BDBN overrides pensions, well, that makes it pretty clear. And I think Hill and Zuda can now be read to really, you know, bolster that view, especially since, uh, and, and then if the deed says other things, such as you can make a pension reversionary midstream, including by way of binding death benefit nomination. And a lot, let's face it, there's a lot of people who might have pensions. And when the pension started, they weren't really thinking about succession planning. But now something that that Hill and Zuda lends tremendous weight to is this idea that, um, you know, if the deed allows it, and if you've got a BDBN, such as our template BDBN, we can just tick a box to say, hey, if it's going to go to my spouse, if I've ticked this box, tick any account-based pension, for example, that I'm receiving upon death, goes to the spouse as an automatically reversionary pension. It's just that easy. So Hill and Zuda, so you know that that's something you'd, you'd want your deed to allow. Dare I say, here's something else which I think a lot of people have overlooked: the requirement that a BDBN has to be given to the trustee. Mm. Um, that's something that Reg 6.17a talks about. Now that we are free from the shackles of Reg 6.17a, why would you want to have that requirement in the deed? Mm. It's such a vexed question, which really does get fought over. Now, I mean, by way of analogy, my will is a private document. If I made a will today, I wouldn't have to tell anyone about it. Now, obviously, when I die, uh, when someone goes and seeks probate for my will, then it becomes a public document, at which point I don't care, I'm dead. Now, why is that a big deal for wills? Well, you know, what if I don't give the money to people who think that they are going to get the money? What if I give it elsewhere? That's It's really up to me. It's a private document. The problem with binding death benefit nominations, there's a heck of a lot of deeds out there that even if they don't expressly link themselves into regulation 6.17a, they still adopt some of that wording or thinking, such as the member has to give, you know, the, the BDN has to be approved by the trustee or given to the trustee, et cetera, et cetera. If the trustee is you and your, for example, spouse, but you want to make the BDN in favor of someone who's not your spouse, that's pretty awkward. It's a pretty awkward conversation to have. Hi, spouse. Uh, how is your day? Yes, mine was fine as well. I'm giving you this binding death benefit nomination. I mean, talk about a formula for a dispute. Uh, and even if you do have that dispute, once you're dead, let's say kids from a prior relationship 
are named as the beneficiaries under that BDBN, how are they ever going to prove that you did give it to your spouse? I mean, mm. what are you going to do? Get a, a formal process server to serve your spouse mm. with the BDBN so, and then get that person to make a stat deck? I mean, you could, but what a what a nightmare. Yeah. Well, Bryce, we had, we obviously had a case in that very matter itself. I think if I recall correctly, it was served, it was deemed to have been served to the accounting firm of which the trustee the registered office of the firm was the um looking after the trustee you know affairs yeah. of that self-managed super fund yeah well that was yeah one of the issues they looked at in the cantor decision yeah which was you know i mean it's yeah it, it's vex it, it's a vex situation but that's what happens when you have deeds that say things like the binding death benefit nomination has to be given or provided mm. to the trustee but one of the other implications of Hill and Zuta, if we are liberated from Reg 6.17a, not only can we have clever deeds uh, that make it very clear that BDBNs override pensions and BDBNs can make pensions reversionary midstream, but also that BDBNs don't have to be given to the trustee mm. uh, during lifetime. So, you know, suddenly, you know, these are the things that if you've got deeds that make all these things clear, you can live these, you know, really wonderful SMSF lives, dare I say. <laughs> I'm probably being overly uh, dramatic in saying that, but you know, I, I just feel... Uh, I've been, I've been, you know, just buzzing since uh, Wednesday the fifth, since ten a.m. Wednesday the fifteenth of June. It's just been a wonderful time to work to to work with SMSF Law. I feel. So uh, SMSF should definitely be reviewing their deeds and documents to check for those kind of things and perhaps update them if those kind of things are in there. Yes, with one important caveat, Miranda, if you have the DBA, if you're in the DBA lawyers fold uh no you, you don't need to check it because i'll just tell you now it's fine we've been uh plan you know this this is the way we, this is what we thought the law was we've been putting this in the deed so uh you know dbl lawyers clients are uh, they can sit back and, and chuckle very good so the other thing i'm interested in there is you obviously spoke to the extent around the flexibility of of other decision making so pensions in particular yes and and obviously then the deed and the ability to to specify which one will override the other so so I guess, you know, for advisors thinking through the decision-making process around, you know, reversionaries in pensions or, like you said, the changes to midstream. So that I guess what this now provides us with and I think what is important for advisors to go back and probably read as well is, is the ATO determination. I think it's SMS FD 28 slash 3, and you'll correct me if I got that wrong. So, um, yeah. But to go back and be very clear now on, on the... The framework in which we operate and, and therefore the clarity that we have in a whole range of these matters in looking at you know the broader estate planning or SMSF based estate planning and, and how that ties in. So yeah, anything you want to add to that? No, I mean look, yeah, it's funny. I mean, yeah, Aaron, you referred to the ATO determination that, that kicked all of this off. Yeah. Um SMSF D 2008 slash three, uh, which is still on the books. Interestingly enough, it's not binding, not even on the commissioner. It's, you know, it did get cited with approval by the Queensland Supreme Court. The reasoning in that determination was ultimately, although the conclusion was the same, the reasoning was ultimately a bit different to the High Court. So I've probably gotten a bit waylaid by uh, by legal details there rather than high level <laughs> thinking. But um, look, th those, those are my thoughts, uh, yeah. which I, I realise probably doesn't quite address the question. Yeah, but I think so. Ultimately, we're we're saying here that go back, look at your documentation, look at the way in which the construct of the deed applies, yeah. and if there are things in there that you have um, that you question the certainty or the question the way in which the construct yes. is, go back and 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 look to readdress these potential issues. Yeah, because we have greater clarity now. Yes, based upon the decision of the High Court. Uh, yeah, that that's correct. Or, or even just practically, you know, speak to whoever provided, you know, I know there's a lot of accountants and financial planners who, you know, quite rightly don't want to be construing dense legal documents. So, you know, or also, dare I say, speak to whoever provided them to say, hey, how does this stack up? Yep. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Bryce. Um, certainly given us a lot to think about and um, some important messages there about just checking your deed, which is always a good thing to do anyway, and the documents as well. Thank you. And Bryce, if I can just finish off, how excited were you in SMSF land that we could <laughs> now have a high court decision and you'll be able to reference the vibe when you come to future <laughs> presentations? Uh, words fail me. Words fail me. <laughs> no, thanks again for your time. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Thank you. So, Miranda, 
always great insights we get from Bryce. Uh, what was the key takeaway that you got from our discussion with him today? Uh, I think it was interesting how he mentioned now that we know that 6.17a doesn't apply to SMSFs, there is a lot more flexibility in terms well, we have certainty that there is that flexibility in terms of it's really dependent on what the trust deed says in terms of uh, pensions and um, whether the binding death benefit overrides the pension and that kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, this real importance now to go back to the SMSF deed and understand what it's actually saying. And, you know, Bryce alluded to and I just kind of asked him around that topic of, you know, we still do see SMSF deeds that uh, have, have built the death benefit area within that deed around the construct of 6.17a. And, and Bryce mentioned in that discussion, you know, that not only is it looking at the way in which that regulation applies or the fact that, you know, you must pay in accordance with, it's looking at all the procedural aspects as well. So um, it is important that you are going back to your deed provider and, and having a discussion or, or trying to understand the implication of it and therefore whether any action should be taken off the back of that. And, um, yeah, I think that's the key lesson that I got from there. And, and ultimately, like I said, we now have a high court decision that we can all hang our hats on to move forward in the way in which death benefit nominations will naturally apply within self-managed super funds. Yeah, it's certainly good to have that certainty now. Yep. So as is always the way, uh, if anyone has any topics or speakers that they'd like to hear from us on the SMSF Advisor Show, Miranda, where can they get in contact with us? Uh, so they can get in touch at editor at smsfadvisoronline.com.au. Excellent. Well, thank you once again for joining us for the SMSF Advisor Show. We look forward to joining us next time. Take care and bye for now. Interest rates are rising fast, and that means higher mortgage repayments. But some lenders have increased their rates more than others, so that could mean your clients are now paying too much for their loan. We can quickly compare your client's rate with hundreds of similar loans, so you are confident that you've got the best rate on the market, or we'll find you a better rate. Make sure your clients aren't paying the highest interest rates. Call Finney today. Visit finney.com.au and let us take the research and admin out of finding a new rate for your clients. 